I'd like to invite you now to stand with me as we open up our time in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to worship you this morning, Lord, we thank you that we can gather freely in this place, Lord. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son, Lord, and created a plan of redemption because, Lord, we are all sinners. We were slaves to sin. But, Lord, through your redemptive power of the shed blood of your son, Jesus, we can call on you as Savior. We can be your children. And, Lord, it's our desire to worship you fully this morning. Lord, we pray that you're pleased with all that we say and we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, well, good morning. Would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? 
Heavenly Father, what a joy to be in your house this morning. Lord, at the beginning of a new year, and Father, there's, there's hope in, in something new. Um, Father, there, there's hope in what lies ahead. Um, but Father, there's also fear and, and trepidation. And so, Lord, we don't know what the future holds, as Jason prayed earlier, but we certainly know who holds it. And as the hymn says, life is worth the living just because you live. And so we give you praise and glory for that this morning, Father. We recognize that our, our hope might possibly be in a new year, but Lord, um, that's a fleeting temporal thing. And that our hope, eternal hope, should be in you as Lord and Savior. And so we just acknowledge that before you this morning. Father, we thank you for bringing us to this place this morning to worship together. We thank you for the ability to worship in song to worship as a community, and Father, to worship through the Word. And so we just commit our time this morning to you. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to hear from Steve. Uh, we thank you for uh, the fact that he and his family can be with us this morning. And Father, as he leads us in worship through the Word, we just pray that you would uh, bless him and that it would be a message for uh, the start of a new year. We just give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. Well, uh, first of all, let me introduce my wife. She's sitting back in the fifth row. Can you wave or something? That's my wife, Barb, and together we've raised four young adult daughters. Uh, we also, my oldest daughter on November 1st gave us our second granddaughter. And so people like to tease me about how many women I have in my life. Believe it or not, even our two cats are female. Um, and, and if you thought I didn't have enough women in, our, in, in my life, about two and a half years ago, God gave me a fifth daughter. Uh, we had a, uh, a high school student from China come to live with us for the last two and a half years. And Lexi is also here today, sitting next to Barb. <laughs> and uh, she is now a freshman at Penn State Harrisburg. And so I, I actually met somebody in the earlier service that went to Penn State Harrisburg. But let's get into the word. Um, I'm excited uh, to have this opportunity to be with you and share from God's Word. Thankful that I don't have to wear a mask as I preach, because that would be hard to breathe. And I want to start by thinking back to the year 2004. Uh, many of you know the actor Mel Gibson made a movie called The Passion of the Christ. You know, that, that movie, if you saw it, focused on the betrayal, the trial, the crucifixion, and the death of Jesus Christ. Um, what made that movie unique among Jesus movies is that it focused on the last day of Jesus' life with only some flashbacks to his earlier ministry. Um, the other thing that made the movie unique is the way it graphically depicted the suffering of Christ. In fact, the movie industry gave it an R rating. There were movie studios that didn't, that didn't want to make this movie. There were critics that gave it mixed reviews, but ironically, the Passion of the Christ went on to become the highest grossing R-rated movie in history, a movie about Jesus. And uh, that movie made over $600 million. And the kids are dismissed. So we'll give them a second. So why am I talking about the Passion of the Christ? Well, it's because some people wonder why the death of Jesus is called the passion. And it's because the English word passion is taken from a Greek word that means to suffer. So therefore, the passion of the Christ originally referred to his suffering on the cross. But over time, the word passion began to have a much broader meaning. And I put a, a, a definition, a modern definition up on the screen. Passion is any powerful or compelling emotion or feeling such as love or hate. Synonyms for passion are words like desire, devotion, excitement, or zeal. And the opposite is indifference or apathy. I think that the evolution of this word is very appropriate. The passion of Jesus Christ originally referred to as suffering on the cross, but his suffering on the cross actually shows his passionate love for us. As Paul wrote, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Clearly, Jesus was passionate about you and me, passionate enough to go to the cross. And my first question today is, 
What are you passionate about? Now, if you are taking notes, I encourage you to write down one or two of your passions. If you're not a, a note taker, that's okay. Just try to picture something in your mind. What are the things that occupy your thoughts or your affections? If you're having trouble, think about the things that take up your time or cost you your money. Uh, I know people are passionate about many things. Some people are passionate about specific causes or problems in the world. You may know people who are passionate about the environment or human trafficking or justice for the poor. Some people are passionate about their favorite sports team. I personally am passionate about the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I like to say that my two favorite teams are the Philadelphia Eagles and who's ever playing the Dallas Cowboys this week. Now, if you're a Cowboys fan, I hope you'll uh, forgive me. You know, as you know, this was a hard season to be an Eagles fan, but thankfully God gives us peace to those who go through trials. I also know many people are passionate about other things. I know people are passionate about clothes or shoes or cars or vacations or home remodeling or other possessions. I hope you've thought and maybe even written down one or two of your passions. Now I want you to think of an even more important question. Are you passionate about things that matter to God? You know, the uh, famous evangelist D.L. Moody once said, our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. You know, most of our passions are probably okay as long as they're not sinful, as long as they don't addict us or they take us away from God. I think it's okay to be excited about sports or hobbies as long as God is number one in your life. You know, we have the Ten Commandments, and the First Commandment tells us that we must not have any other gods before the Lord. But some Christians spend more money on their hobbies than they put in the offering. Many Christians spend more time watching TV than thinking about God, and, and some Christians are more passionate about politics than they are about serving people. Today, what I want to do is look at the example of the Apostle Paul, and we're going to camp out and focus in the book of Philippians. We'll see three things that he was passionate about. And I hope his example will challenge us to consider our priorities as we go into the year 2021. So before I go any further, let's stop and, and pray. Uh, Father in heaven, I thank you for your help for me in preparing this message. I do ask for your forgiveness for the ways I fall short of what I'm about to teach. And I pray that you would help me to apply these things first to my own life. And then I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us in this place, working in each one of our hearts, showing us what we need to know and how we need to change so that our lives would be better pleasing to you. Lord, I give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like in a sermon to have a big idea, something that I want you to remember. And the, the big idea of this uh, sermon is be passionate about things that matter. Let me say it again. Be passionate about things that matter to God. And as we go to the book of Philippians, we can see Paul's first passion as we consider his circumstances. Paul was writing from prison. He was literally in chains, in chains, and there was a real possibility that he would be executed. And yet he writes with incredible joy. It's interesting that the words joy and rejoice are used 12 times in this short letter. If you would, please turn to Philippians 1.21 or look up on the screen. And we'll see one of Paul's three passions. Paul wrote in Philippians 1, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. I think this is an amazing passage. Paul is wondering what's going to happen to him. If he continues to live, then he can continue to serve the Philippians and other churches. But if he dies, he gets to go and be with Jesus. It's kind of a win-win for, for Paul. If he says if he was given the choice, he doesn't know which he would choose. But he does say that his desire is to be with Jesus. If you look again at what he wrote in verse 21, for to me to live is Christ, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now remember, the big idea today is to be passionate about things that matter. And I want to challenge us all to be like the Apostle Paul. First of all, we see that Paul was passionate about Jesus. 
Now that's easy to say, but he isn't passionate about Jesus as a concept, but as a person. To, to Paul, Christianity is all about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he's passionate about knowing Jesus, knowing him more and more every day. You can see this through the, throughout the letter to the Philippians, but it really is focused, uh, there's a real good focus in Philippians chapter 3. Here Paul is writing about his former life as a Pharisee. At that time, Paul was respected, he was comfortable, had very few problems, but even then he was passionate. Then he was passionate about persecuting Christians because he thought the church was a cult that needed to be stopped. So what changed Paul? I, I know most of you probably know that Jesus appeared to Paul on the way to Damascus and Paul gave his life to Christ. And that changed everything. Now, as Paul writes, he's poor, he's uncomfortable in prison, and he's in danger of death. And yet here's what he says about his passion. Philippians 3, verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Talk about passion. Paul says nothing compares to knowing Jesus. He gave up so much to become a follower of Christ. He gave up everything, his position, his his uh, possessions, his reputation. And yet he says here that he considers all those things to be garbage, rubbish, compared to the value of knowing Jesus. I wonder, are we passionate about Jesus like Paul? And if we are, how do we show it in our lives? We can see Paul's second passage in some of his opening remarks as he starts this letter to the Philippians. So in chapter 1, verse 3, he writes this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for all of you making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He goes on, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So the big idea is to be passionate about things that matter. We've already seen that Paul was passionate about knowing Jesus. Here we see that Paul was passionate about God's people, the Philippians. He has a great joy and always prays when he thinks of them. We see his confidence that God will continue to work in them. In verse 6, he says, And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. In verse 7, he says that he has them in his heart. And I love what he writes in verse 8. He says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Apparently for Paul, being an apostle is not a job. It's a passion. Now, I want you to do something. I really want you to do this. I want you to look around. Who do you see next to you? Uh, look to your, your right. Look to your left. I don't see heads moving. You can do this. Okay. If you're watching this online, think of the people you see on a Sunday morning, whether it's in the service or your Sunday school class. Think about people you know from the youth group or you serve with in the children's ministry. Do you have that kind of affection for other believers here at Central Manor that Paul is talking about, where he says, I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul loved the Philippians, and he desired for them to grow spiritually. He talks about this in his prayer, starting in verse 9. He says, that's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Fill with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He wants to see their love grow. He wants to see them grow in purity and to become blameless. So here's another question. Do you have a passion to help your brothers and sisters here grow in Christ? You know, as I've gotten to know Pastor Scott and some of the elders, I know their desire is to develop, is to develop mature disciples of Christ who can impact others, who can impact the world. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says that the role of the church, the role of a church leader is to equip the saints for works of service. 
that means we're all called to be ministers, to be involved in ministry to one another and to people outside the church. You know, as I think about these passions of Paul to know Jesus and serve his people, I'm reminded of a book called Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. I don't know if any of you have read this. Um, I read this book seven years ago and really loved it. The subtitle is called Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus. But I like this book so much, my daughters thought I was crazy. I went out and bought a Not a Fan t-shirt. And one day I was out on the basketball court playing basketball with some guys, and someone said to me, so I don't get it. What are you not a fan of? And I told him, I'm not a fan of Jesus. Now, the guy kind of looked at me because he, he knew I was a pastor. And I said, I'm not a fan of Jesus. I want to be a faithful, passionate follower of Jesus. And so what I want to do is I want to try to explain the difference between a fan and a follower. And I want to apply that uh, with two examples that apply to the first two passions we've already read about in Philippians. So the first example is, the, is a fan of a celebrity, okay? And uh, as an example, I'm going to use my youngest biological daughter, Holly. Holly is currently a junior at Westchester University. She actually just turned 21 years old, and hopefully, good thing she's not here, but she gave me permission to share this. Back when she was in middle school, she was a huge fan of Justin Bieber. I mean a huge fan. She actually wallpapered her room with 14 Justin Bieber posters. She bought a book called The Unauthorized, Ver uh, Unauthorized Biography of Justin Bieber, and she would write down trivia questions, and she would email them to her middle school friends. She knew everything about Justin Bieber. The only problem was she didn't really know him. They weren't friends. He never called her on the phone. You know, when he came to town for a concert, he didn't even bother to stop by our house. She knew everything about Justin Bieber, um, but she didn't know him. Okay? She was just a fan. And that illustrates the first difference between a fan and a follower. A fan may know facts about a person, but they don't have a relationship. And so I want to ask you the most important question I'm going to ask today. Do you know facts about Jesus? Or do you know Jesus? Have you ever started, started a relationship with Jesus by inviting him into your life? Some people think they're Christians because they hang out with people who know Jesus. You may have heard this before, but it's still true. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. You need to have a personal relationship. Do you? And if you do have a relationship, it only grows if you spend time with them. Now, the second example is that of a, a fan of a sports team. I've already told you about my love for the Eagles. Just, just out of curiosity, how many other Eagles fans are, are here? Okay. Well, I won't hold that against you. But for the Eagles fans, uh, I feel your pain. This was a tough one. Uh, let's all think back to three years ago when the Eagles were winning the Super Bowl. I know Eagles fans who can tell, me, tell you all about that game, all the nuances of the Philly special, the trick play at the end of the first half where the quarterback, Nick Foles, catches a touchdown in the end zone. And true fans of the Eagles can, can tell you all of the problems, all the things that went wrong this year. In addition, if you're a fan, you might go to the games, sit in the stands, and cheer on your team. But you know what? You're still not a football player. You've never been thrown to the ground by a 300-pound defensive player. You've never got dirty or sweaty in, in an Eagles uniform because you're just a fan. And it's okay to be a fan of the Eagles. You know what? It's okay to be a fan of the Redskins. But it's not okay to be a fan of Jesus because Jesus wants faithful followers. He wants us to learn from him, grow in our faith, and put it into practice. He wants us to love people. He wants us to serve in the church and help others grow. In other words, Jesus wants us to get in the game. So let's stop and review for a second. Paul's first two passions, he was passionate about knowing Jesus, and he was passionate about God's people. Faithful followers desire to know Jesus more and more and to serve his people Jesus doesn't need more fans. He's looking for followers to get in the game. And that leads to, my, uh, to Paul's third passion. Paul was passionate about the gospel. The word gospel is used over 90 times in the New Testament. I actually counted this. I came up with 93, but then I Googled, and it said there were 98. So 
I wasn't ready to go back and count again. But there's over 90 times that the word gospel is used, um, eight times in the book of Philippians. Philippians is only four chapters. He uses the word gospel five times in the very first chapter. And it's one of the reasons Paul had such affection for the Philippians. It's because of their partnership in the gospel. I'd like to look again at chapter 1. <coughs> I'm going to reread a couple verses, um, verses 3 to 5. Remember how he started. He said, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for all of you, making my prayer with joy. Why? Why did Paul have so much joy in the Philippians? He says in verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Then in verse 7, he adds that they have been with him in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, even while he was in prison. In fact, I love what he writes about his prison experience in verses 12 to 14. He says to them, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. In these verses, Paul talks about the imperial guard. Paul was chained to a guard at all times. One by one, they would be chained to him and have to watch him. And Paul had this attitude. It was like, I'm not chained to you. You're chained to me. Paul knew that he had a captive audience to share the gospel. He would tell them about Jesus and how he had died for them. And it appears that these guards probably went home and told their families. Before you know it, the word was spreading all around about Jesus. People were talking about this prisoner and the God he served. <coughs> Verse 14 is interesting. He says that most of the brothers gained courage to speak the word of God. You would think they would be afraid, but instead of fearing that they would end up in prison, Many believers saw how God was using Paul, and they wanted a witness too. Paul clearly had a passion to advance the gospel. The gospel was the good news that Jesus came to rescue us from our sins so that we could be forgiven, be adopted, and have eternal life. Do you have a passion to advance the gospel and to see other people come to know Christ? Several years ago, I was leading a discipleship group with five other men. These were five young men who were all emerging leaders in our church. And I loved these guys. These guys were committed. We met weekly for two hours with over an hour of homework every week. And these men were passionate about knowing Jesus and about serving God's people. But I'm not sure they were yet passionate about advancing the gospel. One meeting I asked, have you ever led someone to Christ? And only one of the five had ever had that privilege. So I asked a more important question. If someone asks you about your faith, um, how do you share the gospel with them? And they were silent. So I continued, well, let me ask again. Um, like, if someone asks you about Jesus, do you share your testimony? Do you share a gospel um, summary like the four spiritual laws or the bridge or the Romans road? And again, I got blank stares from them. They were passionate about knowing Jesus, but not prepared to make him known. Well, Paul was not only passionate about the gospel, he challenged the Philippians to have the same commitment. In Philippians 1.27, he gives them this challenge. He said, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, I wonder if you think it's possible to be like Paul. Some might think, Paul, you know, Paul, he was like this super Christian. I could never be like him. But look at what he writes in chapter 3, verse 17. He's writing to the Philippians. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul is saying that his life is a pattern for others to follow. It's a, a pattern for us to follow. But in fact, he says to take note of those who are already living like him. I know there are already people here at Central Manor who have a passion for Christ. They're not just fans. They are followers who are already in the game, serving the body of Christ and seeking to advance the gospel. If you know people like that, and I'm guessing you do, take note of their example and learn from them. 
Now let me stop and clarify what I'm saying about sharing the gospel. Because I realize that God gives different gifts to different Christians. We're not all called to be evangelists, but I think we are all called to be witnesses for Christ. You know, only God can bring someone to faith. That's not our responsibility. But there's two things that we can all do. We can prepare and we can pray. First, we should all be prepared. Prepared to share our story of how we came to know Christ and how he's changed our life. And be prepared to, to share the story of Jesus and how a person can start a relationship with them. And second, we should all be praying regularly for opportunities to tell people about Jesus. We are all called to be passionate partners in spreading the gospel. When I think about these three passions, it reminds me of a, of a video I saw by Francis Chan. This is from a series based on his book, The Forgotten God, which is about the Holy Spirit. Um, you actually may notice another football theme. I've never preached a sermon with three football illustrations. So if you have me back, you won't hear it again. But please take a look at this two-minute video. see your team running onto the field and you know how excited you get when it's a when it's a first play they're actually going to run you know and you don't know how they're going to start off the game and you see the quarterback he, he he huddles his team together and and he's in there and he's calling a play and there's all this emotion going on right everyone's so fired up team's fired up he calls the play they break and what if after they broke you saw them run over to the sidelines and just sit on the bench and then 30 seconds later they run back on the field and you see the quarterback huddle them together, you know, and they're running to the huddle. They're so excited to run the huddle and they call this play. Everyone's fired up. They, you know, clap, they break and they run back to the bench again. After a while, you think to yourself, this is really weird. Not only weird, this is really stupid. Guys, this is how the church looks. I mean, think about it. Every Sunday, a pastor gets up in front of a group of people, he huddles them together, and he says, look, this is what we're gonna do. And everyone gets all emotional, like, yeah, yeah, amen, amen. And then Monday morning rolls around. No one does what the pastor tells them to do, but they get together and go, oh, I can't wait till next Sunday. He's gonna call another play. He's gonna give another one of those great sermons. And you wonder why the world looks at the church and go, I, I don't get it, I'm not impressed. I don't." I don't see anything I, that I really uh, look at and go, oh, I wish I could do that. You guys, it's when we actually are out there running the play that the Holy Spirit can come alive in us and people can notice and go, man, how in the world did they pull that off? See, we don't need the Holy Spirit to sit in a room and go, amen, oh, that's good. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, it's great. It's great that you guys get together and you study the Word of God. This is important stuff. The question is, is what do you do with it during the week? I don't know about you, but I get convicted every time I see that video. Um, you know, what do I do the rest of the week with what I hear on a Sunday morning? You know, it would be crazy to see a football team huddle up, call a play, and then run back to the sidelines. Because the full point of football is to play the game. In the same way, we as the church are called to get in the game. We're called to be witnesses for Christ who make disciples. You know, God has a plan to use Central Manor to impact Lancaster County and the world. I really believe that. In this message, I've wanted to challenge you to be passionate about things that matter to God. I shared three passions of the Apostle Paul. And just make an, I just want to encourage you, if you've not read the letter to the Philippians in a while, I encourage you to reread it as we start the year 2021. Think about these priorities and what God is speaking to you. Paul was passionate. He was passionate to know Jesus, to help God's people grow, and to advance the gospel. These passions grew in him because Christ was at the center of his life. How about you? If you're honest, some of you may admit that right now you're apathetic about spiritual things. You, you do consider yourself to be a Christian, but you're not very motivated. If that is you, then there's something you need to know. Apathy is a sin. 
It's the opposite of the passion God desires from us. You may be familiar with Jesus' warning to the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation in chapter 3. He sent them a letter with these strong words. He said, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of, your mouth, out of my mouth. You know, Jesus is writing this letter to Christians, or at least church people. He says that if you're apathetic, if you're lukewarm, then it kind of makes them sick. And you know, I really don't want to offend anyone here today, especially since you're going to be voting in two weeks. But I do want to challenge you, and I want to challenge myself. We are all sinners. Life gets really busy at times. And 2020 was a crazy year. At times, we all get apathetic about spiritual uh, things in our lives. But Jesus doesn't want us to stay that way. He wants to change us. So let me leave you with some good news. Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. He even died for your apathy. Listen to these encouraging words he wrote a few verses later to those lukewarm Laodiceans. He said in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Those are words of encouragement and hope. And if you know you become apathetic, then confess it to God. He's waiting at the door to be invited back into the center of your life. If you don't have a passion for the things of Jesus, then ask his forgiveness. Recommit your life to him, and he will fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you will become on fire for him again. Jesus is passionate about you and me. He wants a relation so much that he went to the cross and suffered for us. My prayer is that we would grow in our passion to know him. And as we do that, we'll have a passion to get in the game, to love and help other believers grow, and to advance the gospel in the world. I pray that we would all repent of our fandom and become faithful followers. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I, uh, I thank you for your word, and uh, I pray that you would make us the kind of people that you want us to be. Forgive us for our apathy, for getting caught up in earthly things, that we don't set our mind and hearts on things that matter most. Would you, Lord, change our hearts and fill us with your spirit, fill us with passion. Lord, I'm so thankful for the passion that you have for us that led you to the cross. I want to be able to say with Paul, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Lord, may we be more than fans. Help us to be faithful followers who invest our lives in helping others grow. And most of all, I pray that we would live in a manner worthy of your gospel and live our lives to share that message with others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.